And now, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm hand of applause to Academy Award winning director Dr. Jan Pinkawa. Thank you so much, everyone. Give me just a moment to set up here and I'll be with you. All right. I think we're running. Shall we put it up? I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be here today. Um, thank you for having me uh, back here in the uh, center of European civilization. Uh, I'm, I've got far too much to say. My apologies to the interpreters. I'm going to speak too quickly. I'm sorry. Um, uh, when Andreas Hakada invited me to make this speech, I thought, what a great honor uh, to speak to you all. And then I thought, oh my God, what am I going to say to the world's best digital artists and technologists uh, that they haven't heard before? And then he explained, well, since the theme is uh, bridging the gap, maybe you could speak about bridging the gap between artistic expression and technological innovation. I didn't understand what that meant. But when I, when I did, when I realized, I jumped at the chance because I realized, how often do you get the chance to pontificate to a captive audience on your favorite subject? Um, I want you please to forgive Andreas his great mistake because now you are all in deep, deep trouble. For the next few endless minutes, you have to listen to my wisdom. Otherwise, you'll have to lose your seat uh, for Danny's unmissable presentation on Spider-Verse. And uh, I'm waiting for that one too. So you're stuck. You'll just have to listen to what I have to say. Ha, 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 ha. Um, you'll soon be asking yourselves, can, can we have the, the screen up? You'll soon be asking yourselves, why me? <laughs> and uh, why him? Well, let me quickly just say, wh why me? Why am I up here? Um, I've been, I guess, a sort of uh, a living bridge between art and tech all my professional life. And that's not just because I lie down and let people walk all over me. Uh, it's because I've been doing stuff like this, uh, at Pixar. I've been uh, 13 years at Pixar Animation Studios where we made a, a short called Jerry's Game, where my role was not only to uh, create it and direct it, but also to really help artists and technologists work together to make something that needed new technology to tell the story. Uh, it was uh, lucky enough to win an Oscar. That allowed me to keep working. The gentleman on your uh, right is, of course, the great storyteller of uh, Silicon Valley, as you know. Um, we made, uh, uh, I kept working until I came up with a, a thing called Ratatouille, uh, which is a story about a rat who wants to become a chef, which is a magical premise that pitches itself. And then um, the, uh, the great Brad Bird adapted and directed this film, uh, uh, leading an army of technologists and artists. Of course, uh, bridging the gap between art and technology is really what Pixar was all about. That and story, story, story. That was the big message of what Pixar was. But you'll all remember John Lasseter's famous quote, the art challenges the technology and the technology inspires the art. Notice that it doesn't say technology challenges the art and the art inspires the technology although that way round is actually more accurate for describing the early beginnings of computer graphics and the difficulties of early production at Pixar. My good friend, the great Rashid El Garab, uh, puts it in a different way. The tech only exists to allow artists to <coughs> express themselves. Uh, as usual, uh, I disagree somewhat with Rashid, but as always, he has a point. For the last uh, six and a half years, I've been creative director of Google Spotlight Stories in Mountain View, uh, California. There we've been uh, described as a team of artists and technologists working on new forms of immersive interactive storytelling. We've made 16 shorts, uh, many of them award-winning, uh, only two or three of them to be ashamed of, and uh, we, we were making content, we were making shows in a technology company. Very remarkable thing. 
Many of you know that we shut up shop last month, um, so uh, that's, that's over. So full disclosure, I no longer work at Google, so um, I can tell you uh, what I really think. My opinions are my own and uh, not those of Google Inc. or those of its subsidiaries or its parent company, full disclaimer. Uh, so uh, you can hear all about that at my APD keynote tomorrow uh, downstairs in the Minding and Sal uh, later in the, in the evening. And I'll bring you up to date with uh, our la last great production, uh, Age of Sale, directed by John Cars, which is a sort of a, a set in a context of uh, new technology um, overtaking uh, the old human art of sailing. Um, okay. So, bridging the gap between art and tech. Uh, here at FMX, we could say, what gap? Uh, we're here to celebrate artists, technologists doing just amazing work. Uh, every, everyone here has, has perpetrated the most amazing miracles. Uh, we're, we're celebrating uh, an industry that is vibrant, uh, using innovative technology to capture audiences all over the world. And everything seems to be working great. Um, in the movies, magic is normal. Uh, every image of um, uh, fantasy or mythology or science fiction can be conjured up by technological art so convincingly real we are powerless to disbelieve it. Um, it, it is, it is uh, completely, um, it's working. S um, so uh, even real time isn't far behind in being convincingly real. So what, what's, what's this about a gap? Maybe the whole thing is just a sort of a, a word game, a misunderstanding, it's semantics. After all, the word art in ancient Greek is techne, which is, uh, sounds like technology, that's what it is. Uh, if we add logos to it, which is the, the reason, as Aristotle said, we get technologia, which is sort of a systematic treatment, which became, in the Enlightenment, in the 17th century, technology, and there it is. So, uh, so there we have it, there's no gap. Uh, uh, art and tech are the same thing. Uh, done, we can finish early. Danny, you're up. No, um, you, you, yes, you've spotted my deliberate error in the equation. It doesn't quite work. Um, but if you ask Google to look at all the books it knows all the way back to speaking of the Enlightenment, so here's the frequency of words in, in English books where the word art and technology crops up uh, from 1700 onwards. So art's always there. And technology, according to Google, the frequency it comes up is new, which of course doesn't make any sense. Um, this is what you get when you ask, uh, do an analytical exercise without asking a question first. You just get data and don't know what you're going to do with it. But it looks like the gap is being closed pretty quickly. Right? It's, it's gaining. I don't know what that wrinkle is at the, at the, at the edge there, but something's happening. Um, and notice where the, uh, the blue line of technology begins to lift off the bottom curve there. You know, um, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, in his uh, treatise Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft, the gay science, uh, in 1882, said famously, God is dead. And it's round about there that this seems to happen. Is this a coincidence? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, uh, analytics, data. Um, but we have uh, all a knowledge of um, technology. We know how technology works. What does technology do? We're all good at talking about it. Uh, it technology amplifies our human effort. Here is my son's uh, vision of that, that we all know because we're seeing images like this all the time. Here is our, our man in his mech suit amplifying his energy and our, our, our technology makes us more powerful. And of course we get used to it and it becomes less interesting after a while. And so we have to make bigger technology and then we, we go from one thing to another and we, and we make larger things and more powerful things and it goes on and on. Um, and that becomes uh, a little less interesting until we want to go even bigger. And this is what technology does, that's how it works. It moves forward, always striving. Uh, once again, Nietzsche was right, it's der Wille zur Macht. It's the will to power, we need to keep going. Um, so on and on and on. So much for tech, we understand it, but what about art? So here I am in the hot seat. I'm going to talk about art in front of all of you, and we need beer for that, because uh, 
There's no way that you can talk about art without beer and, and, not, and not become ridiculous very, very quickly. So please bear with me. We're going to put up some beer. Uh, these are very meaningful beers. They actually look quite real, don't they? Um, this one is, is a Pilsner Orquell from my native Bohemia. And the other one is a Guinness Stout, of course, from the cold, dark, damp uh, British Isles, especially Ireland, which is the island on which the ship of England is grinding through Brexit as we speak. So these are very, very meaningful, meaningful things. Um, so uh, what is art? <sighs> so it's, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a nightmare dream to stand up in front of a live audience with two beers and ask that question, but I'm going to do it. Um, here we go. What is art? Uh, art, according to uh, uh, the usual thing, is, is, well, this. Art imitates life in one form or another. And who said this? Uh, uh, this guy. Um, this is uh, Aristotle. Uh, but Aristotle, of course, wouldn't be happy if I didn't point out that this is not Aristotle. This is an imitation of an imitation of an imitation of Aristotle. Uh, it's a photograph of a Roman copy of a Greek bust of Aristotle. There are three layers of art that are between us and Aristotle. I didn't know him. I don't know what he would think of what was going on today. Uh, but I'll just briefly tell you this. If you go to uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the story class, um, uh, the famous story class in LA, uh, uh, you, will, you will hear all about Aristotle. You will hear that he analyzed poetry and drama and that he, in order, told us what was important. Story first, then character, then thought, then language and music. And at the bottom, unfortunately, was spectacle, which we, we call visual effects. I'm sorry for that bad news. But I, I, don't, I don't want to talk about that. You'll, you'll hear that loud and clear uh, elsewhere. Um, what are we going to talk about? Uh, I've been, for the last little while, dealing with real-time graphics and interactivity in trying to do storytelling with new media, and this naturally puts us in the form area of games and game technology. And we immediately start talking about agency. People say that the difference between games and movies is agency, right? In games, we have agency, we do things. In movies, we are passive. Actually, in movies, we're not at all passive, but that's another story. Uh, and I do think that uh, the agency of games has a profound impact on games' possibilities for storytelling. Um, but what's interesting, um, there was a guy, a British anthropologist called Alfred Gell, who wrote a fabulous book called uh, Art and Agency. And in his, uh, in his seminal paper of 1992, um, called The Technology of Enchantment and the Enchantment of Technology, which is the most delightful title you can imagine, um, he, uh, he took apart the question of what is art and what is it doing. And uh, I was introduced to this by uh, Prasad Boradkar of uh, the Google Advanced Technology and Projects Group, to whom I'm very, very grateful, because these are actually new ideas to me. Perhaps they are to you, which is why I'm talking about them. Well, um, uh, Gell thought that the problem with uh, art is that we don't understand it, actually, and as an anthropologist, and we, we need to think about it from a position of methodological philistinism. If you remember what a Philistine is, it's a person who doesn't care about art, which describes a remarkable number of people in Hollywood. But um, uh, in any case, this is the, uh, what, he's, what he means is that we, um, we, want to give up, uh, we want to give up aesthetics. Uh, what is aesthetics? Aesthetics is a moral question. Is it good? Is it true? Um, uh, this comes from aisthanomai, to feel in Greek. So how do we feel about it? Basically, do you like it? Everyone's a critic. Everyone has ideas and feelings about art, and we'll never get to the bottom of it because, of course, it's just a matter of taste. And, you know, just, art is subjective, isn't it? You like something, I like something else. How are we going to come to any kind of agreement? N uh, that's it. That's where it ends. No, says Gell. He says the right way to understand art is by what it does to people. Okay, this is, um, this is very, 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 very hard to do because people and societies are extremely complicated and artists claim they understand, technologists are trying to understand it. Um, but uh, Gell claimed that art is a component of technology and that it is, in fact, it's the technology of enchantment. It's what we do to influence each other. That's what art is. 
We're enchanting each other in various ways and have been doing it throughout history. It's not mystical. It's, not, uh, it's just a very, very complicated aesthetic technology. Art is propaganda. Nobody, if you think about it, makes art without an audience in mind. Everybody is doing it for somebody, even if initially they're doing it for themselves. You're always thinking about an audience. Now, Gell makes another claim that the power of art over us, and this is weird, the power of art objects on us is not from what they are, but from our imagined explanation of the technical process that went into making them. He says the technology of enchantment is based on the enchantment of technology, that the power that, that, that we get is, called, uh, is from the halo effect of the technical difficulty we perceive in an artwork. We look at something, we imagine a person made it, and we say, wow. Imagine, um, we, we can't see how it was done because it's beyond us. The claim is that powerful art affects us because we have an idea of how it was made through human agency, which is the key thing. Through human agency. It is miraculous because it's done by humans but at the same time, something that transcends us. It's impressive. And I think what he tries to define in the end is cool. That's what we got here. Well, that's, that's what cool is. So, for instance, here's a show that's been running since 1504. Uh, it's very, very cool, right? Um, 500 years, uh, started in 1501 by a 26-year-old by a guy, uh, Michelangelo Buonarroti. And he made it with a chisel, I assume. But how? It's totally beyond me. It's miraculous, isn't it? Right? It's cool. We're awed by this sculpture. And by the way, notice we're not awed by my photograph of the sculpture. I get no prestige from having taken a picture, do I? Not really. No, the guy who, who made the thing I'm taking a picture of gets the prestige for this. Uh, and my, the photographic process that I use to make it, the digital photographic process, is machinery, mysterious, in a way non-human. It's too complex, too buried in difficulty. Okay, so uh, Vermeer's uh, 19, 16, 1658 painting of the milkmaid, it's prized today even in the age of photography, as uh, a painting made by human agency. And it, despite the fact, it, you know, it, it, it has great realism and it captures light beautifully, which is what Vermeer was known for, the light in the room. Um, and um, uh, relative to, to uh, a great artist doing this, uh, a, a camera uh, operator, is a mere button pusher. Quickly, by the way, uh, David Hockney in his Secret Knowledge in 2001, along with uh, uh, Charles Falco, uh, made the case that in fact um, the old masters uh, are, since the Renaissance from about 1420 onwards were using optical devices. They were using lenses and mirrors and that they were using things like the camera obscura and the camera lucida to get their perspective right and to get their, their shading and lighting right. And only in European art do we find in that period shadows happening in art. And he claims that this is because uh, optics were already involved. And it's a very convincing argument. It's very interesting. And it states that basically artists have always used technology, whatever technology is available, to get to their ends, to, to affect you. Um, here's Albrecht Dürer's famous um, uh, woodcut of two guys using a mechanical piece of technology to digitize a lute. And the guy on the right is Ed Catmull 500 years later in Utah, using a contraption to digitize the Utah hand. Actually, 450 50 years later. The point is, artists have always used technology. The technology of enchantment. The picture that every newspaper and magazine critic is raving about. Hear what the usually hard-boiled review of Time magazine says. Snow White is as exciting as a western, as funny as a haywire comedy. It combines the classic idiom of folklore drama with rollicking comic strip humor. It is an authentic masterpiece. 
More than 250,000 paintings like these were created by Walt Disney and his staff of artists to make the most daring adventure in the history of motion pictures with new and amazing characters, Snow White, warm, human. It's hard for us to imagine what, in 1938, audiences saw when they saw Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It was amazing, not only a great technical achievement, but of course, the great technology is the story, uh, which is the, the great impressive thing. But um, it, notice that in this, this promotional trailer, uh, it, um, there are two pieces of technology being promoted, the multiplane camera invented by our Biworks and the Technicolor process. There's lots of technology, but it's warm and human. It's about handmade things, made by humans. They're struggling very hard to remind you that people made this, just as Pixar did when the computer came along and said, this is, the computer's just a pencil. People are making this, believe us. And there's a person involved. There's this Walt Disney and his staff of artists. He's the personality behind it. He's the genius for, to whom the prestige should go. It's a human process. Be, that's why it's so impressive. This is all bad news for visual effects, isn't it? Because the visual effects artist in the deconstructed world of CG uh, is, um, well, visual effects artists are magicians as a class, but as individuals, to the audience, they're, they're just photographers. They're creating things that are real, and that's the point. The point is they should be entirely real and, and believable, and someone just took a photograph of uh, Thanos exploding the universe, and it just happened. So those, it's, it's beyond human agency to imagine how it was done. So... The means of coming into the world of, of the, the photographic visual effects are way beyond us to understand. And despite all our making of videos and everything else, uh, something like Avengers is, is, is unthinkably distant. And uh, it's just not human. Orc armies of VFX artists are marching up the screen in the credits. And it's a collective act of photography. And eventually, just like all technology, it's going to become less and less interesting, maybe. The audience will never care about the VFX artist, which is why Eric Roth still has on the VES uh, website this plea from 2011, which is a plea to, to get respect for VFX. Um, well, there is some good news. We should focus on, on the effects part, I think. Um, in there is effects. Effects, we're making effects. There is an effect. We're changing something as a result of what we're doing in doing effects. Where is that change happening? Is it happening on the screen? No, it's happening in the audience. That's where the change is happening, right? So um, we should concern ourselves with um, what effects we have on the audience. What, what do we hope to do to the audience? And I think all art, especially movies, does the following things to the audience. Number one, it changes uh, your status with respect to money. We need your money, otherwise there's no industry. And there's not, no shame in that. Art and money have been very, very closely linked forever. It's a necessary thing. Um, of course, if you're only interested in money, then you're a banker and you don't have to be in the, uh, in the film business. It's very risky. We want your time. And time is what we feel we've lost when we see a bad movie. That's the thing we actually, is the most precious resource and it's the thing we hate losing. And people complain, I just lost two hours of my life when they see a movie they don't like. Um, but really, someone who is um, uh, a serious entertainer will want to do the third thing, which is to change your mood, make you feel different, just at least during the performance. If, uh, if you feel good, then it's a good movie. If you feel bad, it's a bad movie, right? Um, my first experience with the technical director, Don Schreiter at Pixar, was his binary vision of the emotional range of movies. Happy, sad. That was it. And he had a point. Uh, we all are uh, wanting to go to the movies to change our mood. This is why we do it. And the real entertainer is interested in your money, your time, and your mood. Now, the filmmaker is also interested in changing your perspective, your point of view, giving you some new insight. And this is why Roger Ebert, long before um, Chris Milk and VR, called uh, movies the, uh, the machine for empathy. Right. It's, a, it's to expand our moral uh, imagination to give us an idea that we, we can see things from another point of view. And the great stuff actually affects you directly and lives inside you forever. That's the real art. Those are the classic movies that affect you personally and the culture. All this is true. Now, of course, we know that the, currently the real technological fight is just for the first two, the money and time. Your monetized 
time is what is the value of Facebook and YouTube. Which, and uh, there is no intent in the content, which is why that stuff can tend towards evil. Um, right? This is, um, if you remember your Tolkien, um, the, uh, the Sauron, the Dark Lord of Mordor, uh, uh, has an eye, that lidless eye, uh, 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 that em uh, opens on nothing. This is the Catholic interpretation of evil. Tolkien was a Catholic. And um, this is um, uh, it's, uh, dark as opposed to light, to so say that uh, uh, evil and, and good are not equivalents or, or opposite poles. They're very, very, very different things. Uh, this, this idea of uh, dark and light as metaphors for good and evil was formulated um, by this guy. Uh, this is Saint Augustine of Hippo uh, from the fourth century. Uh, he's the a superhero of the Catholic Church. Notice his cape and his superpowers. His awesome superpowers, he has infinite love for humanity, going from the sacred heart, and of course he has access to the truth. These are unparalleled superpowers. And uh, this uh, piece of photoreal visual effects on behalf of the Catholic Church is by Philippe de Champagne from the 17th century, the French Baroque founder of the Academy of Painting. Um, photoreal visual effects. Who's, who's heard of Philippe de Champagne? Sorry. Okay, art is art because it is not life, as I think Goethe said, or if he didn't, he should have, he said everything. Uh, imitation and abstraction is what you want. You want to get your, your, uh, your guy out of the mech suit and you want to deal with, I think there's a good pub conversation to be had about which of these two characters is most influential on our society. I know my son thinks mostly of the one on the right. Okay. So I'm out of beer. That's, that's the summary of, the, of what I've said. Art has always used technology. We, we're, we're the same thing. The question is, are we any good? Um, art is made for people by people, very important. And please let's be more abstract and do more stuff like Danny. Thank you very much, let's have another drink.